Thank you for the generous introduction. I'm more proud of being your advisor than some of the awards that I got. So first of all, happy birthday to everybody here, and especially to the former director and the current director. Uh, I'd like to congratulate ICTS and all the people here. I took a tour of the campus yesterday, and I was enormously impressed by the institute. I also like the vision of the place and the way it's set up. It's kind of, it looks like a perfectly ideal place. And I'm sure it will continue on this path and will be kind of a beacon of excellence worldwide. I'd also like to thank the organizers of this conference for putting together such a, a stimulating meeting and for inviting me to speak here. Now, it's 10th birthday, one does not usually look at the past. 10th birthday, the person is young, looking at the bright future ahead, and I, in this talk I'll try to offer some vision for the future. But in preparing this talk, I felt, felt like I have an enormous challenge, uh, given the audience. On one hand, this is some of the most brilliant people in the world, and on the other hand, we have a very broad spectrum of background here, people from different branches of science, mathematics, and so forth. So what I th thought I should do is give kind of a bird-eye view of physics, and specifically quantum field theory, and in order to do that, I should really start with some historical context. And for historical context, no better place to start is classical physics. And part one in classical physics is classical mechanics. Describes the time evolution of a finite number of particles. And two names that I put here are Newton and Lagrange, because as the mathematics of this evolved, Lagrange played a crucial role in his Lagrangian mechanics and the role of Lagrangians. And the language this is being used here is the language of ordinary differential equations. In fact, calculus was invented primarily for this purpose. This is why calculus was invented by Newton and others, and developed further by various French mathematicians and others. And this is a more or less done deal. We fully understand that, and everybody is happy. The first generalization of that came about a century or two later, when instead of classical mechanics, we have classical field theory. And the difference between the left side and the right side is that we still have time evolution, but here we have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Not just one degree of freedom, but the whole continuum of degrees of freedom. For example, the electromagnetic field, or the velocity field of a fluid, or a metric, and I put Maxwell and Einstein here, I could have put Nabir and Stokes, and there are other people who contributed uh, to it. Now, both of these, and here the mat natural mathematical language, instead of ODE, we have PDEs, partial differential equations. And the common thing for all of these is calculus. So we can say that calculus is the language of classical physics. We discuss classical physics in terms of calculus. This is the language we use. Calculus is very important. It's very deep. And I thought it, it's appropriate to have one slide to tell you my view of calculus, because we'll contrast that later with things that I will say about more modern developments. So first of all, at the time, this was new mathematics. So the time of Newton, this is Newton, this was new mathematics that had to be invented in order to describe the physical phenomena. And it was usually motivated, was motivated by physics. This was one of the main motivations that Newton had to invent calculus. So these are two elements, new mathematics motivated by physics. Then it had many applications in mathematics, in physics, other branches of science, even in the social science, they use calculus these days. And of course, engineering. This is the hallmark of a deep idea. A deep idea is something that appears to solve one problem, but turns out to solve many other problems it was not intended to solve. So the criterion for a deep idea, it does better than it was supposed to do was designed to do one thing and does many other things. I would also say that calculus is a mature field. So let me present a test of maturity. How do we know whether a field is mature or not? So my test is the following. If most books and most courses are more or less the same. So if you go and take a calculus course here in Bangalore or at Harvard 
or at Santa Barbara or wherever, it, the course will be more or less the same. First, it will teach you how to differentiate, then it will teach you how to integrate, then there will be some differential equations. It's more or less the same logical order. That's a sign that it has been stabilized, the presentation has been stabilized and streamlined. So, so much for classical physics, let me move to quantum physics. And just as in classical mechanics, we had classical mechanics and then classical field theory, here we start with quantum mechanics. And very much like in classical mechanics, we have a finite number of degrees of freedom, except that here these are quantum particles. Many more people contributed to it. I'm not going through the list of people. And the natural mathematical setup is operators acting in a Hilbert space, or we can describe it using functional integral. There are various other ways of describing it. And now we need to put something in the right column, which would be the parallel of what we had before in classical mechanics versus classical field theory. So here we should put quantum field theory, and it's very much kind of completing the square. We have time evolution of an infinite number of quantum degrees of freedom. Before we had classical, now we have quantum degrees of freedom. For example, the electromagnetic field. So unlike the other three parts of these boxes, classical mechanics, uh, classical field theory, and quantum mechanics, this is still an intense field of study. A lot is known, but there's still exciting progress. We've heard some exciting progress this morning. And my personal view is that, it, that a new intellectual structure is needed. And if before we had calculus for both, uh, for both columns, and this was ODEs and PDEs, and now we have operators in a Hilbert space and functional integral, here I feel that a lot more is needed, and I'll say more about that later. And for lack of a better name, I would just call that quantum field theory. This intellectual structure, which is still missing, we just give it the only name we have. I'd like to emphasize that quantum field theory appears everywhere. So let's go through some of the applications. First, in particle physics, this is the language used to describe the standard model. So the standard model of particle physics is enormously successful. Fantastic agreement between theory and experiment. And this is one example. It's not a typical one, but it's a good one. It's the electromagnetic dipole moment. It's known theoretically to enormous accuracy. It's known experimentally also to enormous accuracy. No other branch of science has such spectacular agreement between theory and experiment. So many significant digits. There's nothing in theory, nothing in any science, biology, chemistry, geophysics, even in most of physics, there's nothing that reaches that level of accuracy. And there are two lessons to draw from that. First of all, it really means that we know what we are doing. We really know what we are doing because every digit here probes some other aspects of our understanding. Quantum mechanics, special relativity, the weak force, the strong force, and so forth. The second lesson from here, which agrees with David's talk this morning, is that the experimentalists are better than the theorists. They have one more significant digit that we have, and there's still a long way to go. The second application is in condensed matter physics, and we've heard about it from the three beautiful talks this morning. This gives us, quantum field theory gives us a description of the long distance properties of materials. What kind of phases can there be? What kind of phase transitions can there be between different phases of matter? And it also appears in cosmology. This is where we have a description of the early universe, inflations, fluctuations in the microwave background radiation. That all comes from quantum field theory. Quantum field theory also appears in the study of quantum gravity and string theory. And over the years, it has appeared in three different places there. First, it appeared in, on the wall sheet of the string. The wall sheet of the string sweeps, the, the string evolves a two-dimensional surface. And there is a quantum field theory on that surface, which is essential in describing string theory. The second application is in the low energy approximation, where we have ordinary particles, ordinary fields, where the string is approximated by a point, and that's another place quantum field theory appears. And in, over the last 20 years, it became clear that the whole theory could be just a quantum field theory in disguise. And that came from gauge gravity duality or ADS-CFT. I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. So that was another application. And finally, there's the application in mathematics, especially in the fields of geometry and topology, where results from quantum field theory completely changed some fields in mathematics. In fact, this week there was a 
cool here about gromov witten invariants, which were really motivated by physics, by the study of Calabi-Yau manifolds. That's why the mathematicians were interested in it. And in physics, it came from this application of field theory, of the wall sheet of the string uh, propagating in some Calabi-Yau backgrounds. So continuing with quantum field theories everywhere, it's really reminiscent of the story of calculus. We have some intellectual structure, which was invented for one purpose, describing a system with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, or a system which is both relativistic and quantum mechanical, and it has these applications everywhere. So it's the natural language to describe diverse phenomena. And even though we have seen a lot of progress over the last decades, uh, progress is still continuing, and there, is a lot of, there are many indications that our understanding is incomplete. And since I've been saying that before and I was criticized, I would like to make it absolutely clear, it's not that our understanding is wrong, I think that big pieces are still missing, and perhaps the theory should be reformulated. So I'd like to go back to the analogy with calculus and make this analogy more complete and see how, as a scorecard, how quantum field theory uh, does relative to calculus. So I just copied the slide before about calculus. Calculus was a new mathematics at the time. Well, it's clearly new here, because to the extent that we know it, we think it's not only is it new, it's not yet even rigorous. So that's even something for the future to make it rigorous. So that's clearly new mathematics. It was clearly motivated by physics, by particle physics and condensed matter physics. So that part is very much like calculus, new mathematics motivated by physics. Many applications, both in mathematics and in physics, very much like in calculus. And as I said, in the case of calculus, this is a sign that it is a deep idea. Something that was invented for one thing and has applications everywhere, that's clearly a deep idea. And in that sense, I think quantum field theory is very much like calculus. The next thing in calculus in my list was the maturity test. And I recall the criterion. The criterion for maturity was that all courses are taught more or less the same. All books are more or less the same. Maybe the examples are different, but it's basically the same presentation. Not true for quantum field theory. If you take two quantum field theory books, they look totally different. One of them starts with scalars and then add interactions. The other one starts with fermions and scalars and gauge fields that are free and then adds the interaction. Another one starts from the renormalization group. Every one of them starts from a different starting point, and the subject has not yet been streamlined, so it's not yet mature. And there are indications that we still miss big things, and perhaps the theory should be reformulated, and I'm going to say more about that uh, soon. So how do we think of quantum field theory? There are two main approaches, and there are other kind of sub-approaches which are smaller. The first is the traditional approach, where we start with the Lagrangian, we write down the Lagrangian and we quantize it. I'll have a few more slides about that soon. And the second approach, which is more abstract, we write down the list of operators and they have correlation functions. And these correlation functions have to satisfy some conditions. I'll have some words to say about that soon. So in this approach, the traditional approach, this one is an outcome. We start from a Lagrangian and we derive the operators. More abstractly, we can think of the operator and say this is the definition of the theory. So let me spend one or two slides about this. So in the more abstract definition, in the more abstract presentation of quantum field theory, we start from a collection of operators, and they have some correlation functions, and they have satisfied some consistency conditions, like unitarity, these operators, are, the correlation functions are single-valued as we take one operator around another. We can formulate the theory in curved space and get unambiguous results, and so forth. And these are many, many consistency conditions. The system is highly over-constrained, and if you try to solve these consistency conditions, it's miraculous that you can find any solution to them at all. And if you find the solution, you get the exact solution. And that's very impressive when it works. Unfortunately, this approach is not very satisfactory, because there isn't a clear starting point. Because you list, you kind of throw in the box all the consistency conditions, and you put it, say, on the computer or something, and you try to solve for something that satisfies all the consistency conditions, and a solution comes out and say, ah, that's a good quantum field theory. But there's no clear starting point. The alternative is to use Lagrangian. This is the most traditional approaches. That's the most, that here, the advantage is that we have a good starting point. 
we know what we're doing. We write some classical Lagrangian, and then we quantize it. And we can use canonical quantization or functional integrals. There are other more sophisticated methods. Here we need to regularize to make the theory make sense. For example, instead of having a continuum, we can put a lattice there. And in condensed matter applications, the lattice is actually real, so it's not something that we just add to the system. Here the challenge is to prove two limits. One is the continuum limit, when we take the lattice spacing to zero. And the second, the large volume limit, when we take the size of the lattice to infinity. This is a huge challenge, and all the difficulties are buried in here. But this is one approach based on Lagrangians. This approach leads to a number of questions. So we write down a Lagrangian, we quantize it, and we just follow our nose and do what we can. First question, do we know all possible Lagrangians? Can it be that there are more Lagrangians that we can write down, more terms that we can write down that are allowed, and we haven't yet thought about them? That might look like a strange question to ask, but over the last several years, new terms were added, terms that had been missed before. So maybe there are others. Second question, do we know all the consistency conditions? Can there be more consistency conditions that have not yet been imposed? Also, sometimes two different Lagrangians lead to the same physics. That's the idea of duality. So that's a strange starting point, because it does not uniquely, it, does not, it specifies the theory uniquely, but the same theory could have more than one Lagrangian. And I'll say more below. Now, when are Lagrangians good? Lagrangians are good when they are weakly coupled. So we have a theory which is almost free, and the interactions are small, and they come in three varieties. Variety number one, here the UV is short distances, and the infrared is long distances, that's the terminology. We have a free theory of short distances, and it becomes more and more strongly coupled as we come to the infrared, to long distances. And we can say that at short distances, we formulate the question. This is a question. This is what the theory does at short distances. And in the spirit of reductionism, emphasized by David this morning, we formulate what's known, it, what's known at short distances. We ought to find the answer is what happens at long distances. So this is the question, and this is the answer. And I put a question mark here because often it's not easy to find the long distance behavior of the field theory. And these are some examples. The alternative in uh, the second possibility of having weakly coupled Lagrangian is that we have a free theory at long distances. For example, th three plus one dimensional electrodynamics or chiral theory of pions. And here the question mark is in the ultraviolet at short distances. So here we know the answer, and we ask ourselves, what are the possible questions that can give us this answer? And again, there could be more than one, an more than one question that gives the same answer. The third possibility is that we have a family of scale invariant theories. One of them is free at one end, but then the theory becomes more and more strongly interacting as we move to the right. And we have various examples of such theories, theories that are it's a family of scale invariant theories. Some of them are free, and it, one of them is free, and then the interaction becomes stronger and stronger. And the Lagrangian is useful. This whole way of thinking in terms of Lagrangian is good when the theory is free or the interactions are small. And it's totally useless when the interactions are large. I'd like to emphasize that the Lagrangian is not good enough. First, there's a question I've already alluded to, of strong coupling. The Lagrangian is fantastic when it's weakly coupled, because then it's kind of wizzy wig. What you see is what you get. You see the fields, that's what you have as the answer. But then when the interactions are strong, it's not wizzy wig. You can start with one set of degrees of freedom and end up with a totally different set of degrees of freedom. And that's when quantum field theory is interesting. And it's usually hard to determine the behavior at strong coupling. I should also emphasize that whenever exact solutions are known, the way they are known and the way the solution is found is not by using the Lagrangian. There are some exceptions, but by and large, exact solutions are found not by using the Lagrangian, by using, but by using the more abstract point of view with the operators and their correlation functions and their uh, consistency conditions. That's how most systems in two dimensions were solved, in one plus one dimensions. Uh, that's also what's tr uh, true within integrable systems. The Lagrangian is not a natural starting point. And then there is the notion of duality, which is extremely surprising. And I think something I'll, I'll say more later, the fact that we are surprised by duality is the fact that we don't understand it. 
because once we understand something, we are not surprised when it happens. If we are surprised, we say, wow, how did this happen? It shows that we don't understand it. And in addition, we have quantum field theories that we know and love, and we can prove rigorously that they cannot come from a Lagrangian. So these are strongly coupled theories that cannot come from a Lagrangian. There is no Lagrangian at shorter distances, which is free, and flows to these theories at long distances. So even if you love Lagrangian and you dismiss these points, you are not going to be able to describe these theories that don't have a Lagrangian. So this is a big challenge. I would like to suggest that what all this means is that quantum field theory should be reformulated, that there must be a better way of thinking about quantum field theory. And let me review some of the arguments. First, our natural starting point based on Lagrangians that are being quantized, as I said, are not good enough. One way of saying it is that when we have a Lagrangian and we quantize it, we assume that there is a classical system, and the quantum system is obtained by quantizing the classical system. We have some classical system, we have some phase space, we quantize it and we find the quantum field theory. These theories that don't have a Lagrangian are intrinsically quantum mechanical. They don't have a parameter like h-bar that we can pretend that we make it smaller and then the theory becomes more weakly coupled. The theory is intrinsically quantum mechanical and it's not obtained by starting from something else which is classical and then later we quantize it. So that's a statement that Lagrangians are not good enough. Second, it's not mathematically rigorous. Now, this is a very peculiar thing that we have a theory that we know is right. We show this spectacular success with so many digits. That's not a coincidence. It has had a lot of impact on mathematics with new results, new surprises in mathematics. It's clear that something very deep is going on here, and yet it's not mathematically rigorous. And every approach to make it mathematically rigorous get stuck somewhere else. And in fact, some mathematicians say, one quote I heard is that, you guys have lots of theorems, but no definitions. So you have lots of results, but you don't know what you're talking about. I think this should be viewed as an opportunity, both for physicists and mathematicians. And I believe that if we find a rigorous formulation, it will not just be kind of uh, being careful about details, but in fact, it will give us new insights new insights that I think we miss, and if we have this better understanding, that would help <coughs> in the future. We also have examples motivated by string theory of ideas that are generalizations of local, traditional local quantum field theory, like field theory on a non-commutative space. There's something called little string theory, and there might be others. That's very interesting because these are not gravitational theories, we know they exist, they come from string theory, they satisfy most of the properties we would like a quantum field theory to satisfy, but not all of them. For example, this theory doesn't have a traditional energy momentum tensor. And yet, it's almost as good as a field theory. <coughs> so before I talked about theories that are traditional, good old-fashioned quantum field theories that can do not have a Lagrangian, this thing is worse. This thing is worse, and yet it exists. So it's clear, it kind of screams, we don't understand something. There's something here we don't understand. Finally, we have this gauge gravity duality, which has been dominating our field for the last two decades, or it's also known as ADS-CFT. So this is the ADS and this is the CFT. And this shows that quantum field theory is dual to a theory of gravity. And gra finding a theory of quantum gravity is clearly a deep question, and we clearly need deep new ideas, so if we fully understand quantum field theory, we'll also understand better gravity, and that also tells us that something deep is still missing. And finally, as I said before, quantum field theory con consistently surprises us. We've heard these three talks this morning, and these speakers cover just the tip of the iceberg of all these topological phases and new fancy phenomena in condensed matter physics, which are really surprising. It's amazing that quantum field theory could do that thing. And these new phenomena continue to come in, and we are constantly surprised by them. So that, together with duality, I would say, tells us that enormous progress, we are surprised by it. It clearly means that we don't know, 
we don't understand deeply what's going on, there must be a deeper formulation. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and say again, happy birthday, ICTS, and keep doing the good work. Thanks, Nati, for a fantastic talk. Mm -hmm. Questions? Nati, I was waiting for the punchline. There isn't any. What's the reformulation? Come oh, on, I'll speculate. Uh, the 20th birthday of ICTS, I'll give a talk here if I'm invited. <laughs> I don't have any. I wasted a lot of time. If I really had to go on a limb, I would say that this separation between short distance and long distance should go away. Because the reason, the reason is, is this is the first, this is the one thing that most of us would think this would def better not go away. <laughs> so that was one argument. The other argument that I can throw into the mix is the issue of uh, the hierarchy problem, or naturalness. For, ev for many years, I believed in naturalness. I am still a believer of naturalness, but we have to face reality. The LHC has not yet found anything. So it might be that that's just the way things are. It might be that there's something the LHC misses and it's just around the corner. I would still hope that this is what's going on. But it might also mean that there's something basic about quantum field theory, which would make this whole question of naturalness just go away. I have nothing to add to this, but it again speaks about these long distance and short distances. You're not satisfied with the answer. I can tell you one thing, I'm not satisfied with this answer either. <laughs> That's the best I can do. Already you are giving the answer where we are missing something. The basically, we are talking about short distance and long distance, but there is in between something. Sorry, that? There is in between something, in between, some, yes. in between from short distance to long distance. Yes. So our approach should be to try to understand, starting from some distance, how to go step by step, step by step, yes. in a distance scale yes. till the end. Yes. As long as you just concentrate on both the end points, I think we have enough opportunity to miss out a lot of okay, things. Okay, this step of going from one to the other step by step, this is what is known as the renormalization group. And this has been kind of one of the pillars of quantum field theory over the last how many, 50 years now, give or take? Maybe I'm wrong by the counting, maybe 40 years. And this has been enormously successful. And that's the only way I can think of quantum field theory. I don't know any other way of thinking about it. And in the two ends, things simplify. But there's a beautiful story in, in between. And some systems that are completely solvable are solvable exactly as a function of the scale. So we know everything that's, that's going on in between. There's no surprise there. <coughs> so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the simplest quantum field theories, the topological quantum field theories as a possible uh, playground or a place for this mathematical reformulation. There are mathematical formulations of, of this. So do you think that's very special to that case or uh, can one generalize? Okay, so usually when you try to attack a big problem, it's a good idea to find a simple one. And quantum f the topological field theory is really perfect for that, because on one hand, it's a quantum field theory with all its intricacies, or at least most of its intricacies. And on the other hand, it has finite number of degrees of freedom. It's much more manageable, and it can be made mathematically rigorous. So over the last several decades, there's been enormous progress in formulating topological quantum field theory in a way that is not only more rigorous than the way physicists think about it, but even to the point that it is useful for us. So most physicists have this attitude, we basically know how it works, we don't care about these subtleties and let the mathematicians worry about that. that I think this is completely wrong. And in fact, over the last several years, especially in the context of these topological phases of matter, the state of the art in the classification of topological phases was actually done by mathematicians who tried to do it very rigorously. These are Fried and Hopkins and collaborators. So they did the most complete job 
about that. And that really relies on heavy duty mathematics, much more than things that I understand. So that's actually a good example of, if you try to understand what quantum field theory is, focus on the simpler version, which is the topological field theory. And that's also an example where the more sophisticated mathematics and the, deep, uh, the precise reformulation led to results that surprised physicists, gave new insights, corrected mistakes, and gave a much better view of the subject. I don't like to make predictions because historically, whenever I made a prediction, it turned out to be wrong. But I think we should try and do whatever we can because there is clearly a challenge, and I think the challenge should be addressed. And once we figure it out, it will pay off. Which approach will be more useful beyond me? So, Nadi, uh, let, let me say a few words about my thoughts on this subject and see whether you agree. It seems to me that the main problem here is locality and our understanding of space and time. And the examples you gave, you know, it's where we are unsure of what this framework, I like to distinguish from a theory. We have examples of particular quantum field theories that are totally understood. No problem. It's a closed subject as a theory. But as a framework, we have no idea where it leads. It includes string theory, it seems. And the ignorance is when we start, say, considering going from the infrared to the ultraviolet, an infinite domain of, with higher dimension operators, irrelevant operators. And we have a few examples where we can do that, like field theory in a non commutative space time or string theory. But it all has to do with space time, on the one hand. And we, it all has to do with locality. We get into. And on the other hand, as you remarked, uh, string theory appears to be an equivalent way of describing quantum gravity, equivalent to, quantum, to the quantum field theories we know and understand, which suggests that dynamical space-time is really emergent. Space-time is emergent. So don't you, my feeling is that the reformulation of quantum field theory and the uh, definition, in, in a sense, of what the framework finally is will only emerge once we learn how to, what emergent space and time is. The big, you know, Newton established equations of motion for particles in, in a gravitational field, but it really took a lot of mathematical work and physical understanding to understand, even for single particles, not field theory, what the complete framework is, what, you know, what second order differential equations, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And that we don't know. We don't know what the, but do you, do you agree that? I agree with almost everything you said. First of all, I think you just endorsed the statement that a deeper understanding is needed and it might even lead to a complete reformulation. Now, you put your finger on locality and space-time. When I responded by this long distance versus short distance, it's a cousin of the same thing. Because if you don't have locality, how are we going to separate long distances from short distances? I agree with that completely. The only thing I can slightly Hey, John, is that you said that you need to understand emergent space and time before this progress. I'm not sure at what order it will happen. It might be that the whole thing would be at once. I feel that this is somewhat easier than to understand the full thing. The full reformulation of the final, the final theory of everything that explains how space emerges, how time emerges, what it means to have unitarity, because if you have emergent time, you need to understand what it means to have unit. So this really speaks to all these deep questions that I, this might take till the 30th celebration here rather than the 20th. <laughs> oh. Okay. 
थैंक्स अलॉट मैथ